Let us pray to the Lord, Lord have mercy. Lord Jesus Christ, to you I cry, hear me, your unworthy servant, enlighten my mind, grant that I may truly and clearly describe your way into the kingdom of glory, which you in your mercy have granted us. Grant that those who read and listen to these words may be filled with your love, enlightened by your knowledge, and made strong by your power. Warm our hearts with your spirit, and we shall joyfully and fervently go the way which you have shown us. My hope is the Father, my refuge is the Son, my protection, the Holy Spirit, Holy Trinity, glory to you. I place all my hope in you, Mother of God, keep me under your protection. Please be seated. Good morning. This is our sixth meeting of the year for the adult education program. We're making our way through the liturgy. Last, last month, we talked about the great entrance specifically and the cherubic hymn. So well, I'm just going to recap for a second what we talked about last time. So we talked about the liturgy moving from the catechumens to the liturgy of the faithful. So now the focus of the liturgy has shifted from the gospel to Holy Communion. We also talked about the prayers of the catechumens, which are typically not used in our churches anymore, and how the catechumens in the old church, in the ancient church, were asked to leave at this time, and they were asked to depart from the church because they were not baptized, and so they could not receive a Holy Communion. Uh, even though, of course, the catechumens are not full members of the church, they're still an important part of our church family, and so we need to pray for them as well, and perhaps one day these petitions will make their way back into our liturgy in a, in a more general, uh, instead of maybe one or two churches using them, in a more general way. We talked, as I said, about the Trubic hymn and the great entrance. Originally, this part of the service was when the deacons would leave the building to go to the other building to get the gifts and bring them into the church proper. Uh, as time went on, uh, this part of the service became more elaborate, it became a detailed procession. The priests started to take uh, part in it as well. They were chanting psalms, and they were chanting the true hymn. There are also many theological interpretations to the great entrance. We talked about how St. Nicholas Cavasilas compares the great entrance to Palm Sunday, to Christ's uh, glorious entrance into Jerusalem. And here Christ makes his entrance into the altar. St. Germanos also compared it to the crucifixion and the burial procession. And he says that once the gifts are placed on the table and are covered, it's as if Christ has been uh, crucified and buried in the tomb. Finally, the priest uh, is preparing himself for the great sacrifice. So we talked a little bit about the office of the priesthood and the honor that comes with it. And not only the honor, but the great responsibility uh, that comes with it as well. So... The last one of the last points I made was that we need to pray for our priests just as much as the priests pray for the people as well. So with that, we will move forward to the next section. So after the completion of the great entrance, and once the priest has placed the gifts on the holy table and covered them with the uh, altar covers, the aera, uh, which was that rectangle sheet that I had shown you last week with the cross, or the last month with the cross on it, um, once he's covered the gifts with that and sensed the altar table, there is immediately a set of petitions called the plirotika, or the, lit the litany of completion. Let us complete our prayer to the Lord, is the first petition, which is where the word plirotika, or completion, comes from. So interestingly enough, in my research I found that these petitions are not really... They don't really have anything to do with the actions that are taking place in the liturgy at this time. Remember, we talked about how in the liturgy of the faithful, our, we're doing everything to get ready for Holy Communion. We're doing everything to get ready for the sacrifice and the sacrament of Holy Communion. These petitions are dismissal petitions. So in the old church, in the former times, before the petitions were placed here, these would be at the end of the service, before the dismissal. Uh, and at some point, they were moved up um, to this point in the service, and some petitions were added, making reference to 
the holy gifts and our preparation for receiving Holy Communion. <clears throat> Even though they don't, are not exactly correlated with the action of Holy Communion, that doesn't mean, of course, that they have no purpose. Uh, in these petitions, we pray for a lot of very important things. So in Father John Magulius's liturgy book, and you should have this on your quote sheet. Does everybody have a quote sheet? There's some over here, too, if we can pass them over. Thank you, Steve, if you can get those to everybody. Um, so Father John Magulius, in his liturgy book, comments on this part. He says, during these petitions, we beseech God. We're asking God to grant us spiritual comfort. Spiritual comfort, not earthly comfort, but spiritual comfort. By granting everything that is necessary for our salvation. So in these petitions, we are, we're asking God whatever we need for salvation for them to be given to us. As the people sing with the choir, the grant this, O Lord, which is the response, uh, each petition becomes a personal prayer that is shared through a community of worship. We continue offering our prayers so that they may be completed by our participation in the Holy Eucharist. So in these petitions, in other words, we are praying for the things we need for salvation, and that prayer, these prayers, will be complete when we receive Holy Communion. So some of the petitions that we have are, uh, we pray for what is necessary to make our offering. We pray, for, we pray for the gifts to be blessed and accepted by God. We pray for holiness. We pray for peace, which we'll talk about a little bit later. We, we pray for an angel to guide us and to protect us. We pray for forgiveness and for strength to complete the course of our life in a godly way. We pray that at the end of our lives we may stand worthily before God. So really these petitions, we can think about them as they are petitions not only for today or for the week, but really for the rest of our lives and for even for all eternity. So I want to take a quick look at the prayer that accompanies these petitions. It should be on your sheet as the second quote as well. So this prayer in former times... I love the liturgical history of our church. It's very interesting to see how the liturgies changed over the years. So this prayer, at, uh, before the priests were part of the great entrance, they were in the altar, and this was one of the prayers that was prayed before the great entrance, or during, actually during the great entrance when it was taking place. Uh, and it's, so it's a prayer of preparation for the priests and for the clergy to offer the gifts worthily. And the prayer reads, as you can follow along on your sheet, O Lord God Almighty, who alone are holy, who receives the sacrifice of praise from those who call upon you with their whole heart, receive also the prayer of us sinners and accept it at your holy altar. Now here when the prayer says us sinners, it's referring to the priests specifically. Enable us to offer you gifts and spiritual sacrifices for our sins and for the transgressions of the people. And that's how we know why. That's how we know he's talking about just the priests here. Um, because there's a distinction of the people, the priests, and the people. Make us worthy to find grace in your presence, so that our sacrifice may be well-pleasing to you, and that the good spirit of your grace may dwell upon us and upon these gifts here presented and upon all of the people. So the purpose of this prayer is for God to make the priests worthy to serve, both for themselves and for the people. The priests don't do the liturgy by themselves, for, or for themselves, I should say. In fact, if a priest is by himself, he cannot perform the divine liturgy. At least one other person has to be present. And we, have, we as priests, of course, have our own sins and our own transgressions. We have our own brokenness. And these sins of the priest, St. John Chrysostom talks about how these sins of the priest, they hold even more weight than the sins of the people, and they require even greater help from God. The priests also bear the sins of the people. So we as priests, myself, Father Timothy, all the priests, the bishops, we bear the, the sins of the people, all of you, because you are our responsibility. And we're responsible for your spiritual growth. And so only God can make the priest worthy to offer the sacrifice of the liturgy, despite our unworthiness. Every priest is unworthy of serving in the altar and offering the sacrifice to God. But it is God who makes us worthy through his grace and through his mercy. So that's the first purpose of the prayer, for God's grace on the priests to offer the gifts. For the second, uh, one of the second, or for the second purpose of the prayer we have uh, that we are called is for the gifts to be accepted by God and that the Holy Spirit will come down on the people and for the gifts. 
So not only for the priest to be worthy, but for the offering to be worthy, for the sacrifice to be worthy, and for it to be accepted by God, and so that God the Father will send the Holy Spirit down on us, and that we may be transformed along with the gifts um, into godly and holy people. This is why it's really important, and the prayer says this too, that we're called to serve God and to worship God with our whole heart. It says that in the prayer too. You receive the sacrifice of praise from those who call upon you with their whole heart. So in the spiritual life, and especially when we're in divine liturgy, where we will all be united with Christ in Holy Communion, our love for God should burn like a fire, should burn like a flame, in the same way that the saints of our church did. I mean, think about some of the saints of our church. One of the amazing examples is St. Anthony, who lived over 80 years in the desert, praying continually because all he wanted and all, the only thing in his heart was his love for God. He wanted to be united with God in every way. Think about a recent saint we celebrated was St. Karalambos. St. Karalambos was over 100 years old and was a priest. He was serving liturgy every day, and when they came to arrest him, he refused to give up his faith, even though he was old and frail. And they even dragged him through the streets tied to the back of a chariot. But he still didn't give up his faith, and he became a martyr. Think of someone like that. Think of St. Catherine, our, our patron saint of our chapel here, who was beautiful and rich and had a power and authority in, her, in, where, in the land where she lived. And she gave all of it up so that she could be with God for eternity. In the words of St. Paul, this is also on your quote sheet here, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or even the sword? Neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, I'm not there yet. I'm not, I'm, I'm not at that place where my love for God burns like the sun or something like these saints, you know, these saints experience in their lives. And that's okay for now. It's okay for now. We all have to start somewhere. Uh, but the expectation is that as we grow spiritually, as we progress, as we deepen our faith, that we will have that love, that God will spark that flame in our hearts and that we will carry it everywhere we go. And when we come to the divine liturgy, let it be an inspiration for us. Let the liturgy inspire us to an even greater level of faith, understanding the sacrifice that he made for us and now our unity with him through the divine liturgy. Okay, after, this, uh, after these petitions and this prayer is read by the priest and the exclamation to complete the prayer, uh, the priest blesses the people, and then he says this following phrase, Let us love one another, that with one mind we may confess. Let us love one another, that with one mind we may confess. And at this time, the priests, if there are more than one, exchange what we call the kiss of peace. They greet each other with a, a, a kiss and with an embrace, and they say to each other in dialogue, Christ is in our midst, he is and always shall be unto the ages of ages. Amen. What's interesting about this is that in order to confess the right faith, what is the precondition? So let us love one another that with one mind we may confess. So if we want to confess properly the correct faith, what do we need to have first? We need to have love. Love for one another, love for God. We need to be unified and be united uh, with one mind, and then we can confess the faith. And we'll see in just a few minutes that following this portion of the service, immediately is the creed, which is the confession of faith of our church. So the kiss of peace, which the priests do in, their, in, their, in the altar, is a remnant, again, of another ancient section of the liturgy. So in the ancient church, not only the priests, but the whole congregation would exchange the kiss of peace. So Christ, and why, do we, why did they do that? Christ in the Gospels, if we open up our Bibles at home, and this is on your quote sheet as well, Christ in the Gospel of John says, By this they, meaning the non-Christians, will know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. So the definitive characteristic of Christianity and of Christians, true Christian disciples, are 
is love. There's no other bar that we have. And we heard that even in the gospel today uh, of the sheep and the goats and uh, the righteous being the ones who loved their neighbors and the unrighteous, the ones who were condemned, were those who did not love their neighbors. It makes sense then that if love is such a great uh, definitive character of our church, that as we approach the highest form of discipleship to Christ, which is eating his body and blood in Holy Communion, that we have to show that we love one another. We have to show that we are his disciples and that we love each other as one family. Father Lawrence Farley, who has a great book, and I've, I've re re referenced it before in our talks, uh, called, I believe it's called Walking Through the Divine Liturgy, he explains, and this is in your quote sheet, through this sign of unity and love, meaning the kiss of peace, the church commended her prayers to God, for such unity and love made her acceptable to Him. So through the kiss of peace, through the sign of unity and love, was how the church offered their prayers to God. And in fact, in the ancient church, not only in the liturgy, but in every gathering, Christian gathering, they would exchange the kiss of peace. It was a sign of, uh, of their Christian unity and that they were actually Christians. We also hear in the gospel, again, on your quote sheet again, lots of quotes here. And uh, again in the gospel, we hear Christ explaining, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has anything against you, meaning one of your fellows, one of your fellow Christians has something, or even not non-Christian, if another person has something against you, if there's a, a strife or if there's uh, a division between you, leave your gift before the altar and go your way. Be first reconciled with your brother and then come to offer your gift. In other words, what is Christ telling us? If we have disputes or if we have grudges or if we have resentment or if we have hatred towards any of our fellow humans, we are in no way prepared to offer our gift to God nor receive the gift that God is offering to us. The early church, as I said, took this very, very seriously. And there's an old Christian, I like to call it an instruction manual. It's called the Vidahi. It's like the teaching book of the early church. It was written, it's from around 100 AD. So it's one of the earliest Christian texts that exists. We find in that book instructions saying, Let no man having a dispute with his fellow join your assembly until they have been reconciled that your sacrifice may not be defiled. So if there were two Christians that were fighting with each other and the community was aware of it, they were not even allowed to come into the church. They would have to make up and be reconciled and then they would be allowed to enter and offer the sacrifice with the whole community. Again, I'll quote Father Lawrence. He says, In the liturgy, through the kiss of peace, brother finds opportunity to be reconciled to brother and the church reestablishes herself in the peace of Christ. For it is only when the church as a body, as a whole community, rests in the peace of God, and when all of her members are in unity, that her corporate sacrifice can ascend to God and to bring salvation to the faithful. So we have to examine ourselves a little bit and say, do I have something against one of my fellow parishioners? Do they have something against me? What's going on? What can I do to, to rectify the situation? What can I do to reconcile with them? Notice also that in the service, when the kiss of peace is being exchanged by the priests, the people, or the choir with the people, chant Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Trinity in oneness, Trinity one in essence and undivided. So our own unity as the body of Christ, our own unity as one Christian family, is a reflection of the Holy Trinity. It's a reflection of God himself, who is a unity of three divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, one, pers one powerful personal experience that I'll share with you from my own very young priesthood is that last year uh, I went to my first clergy retreat, which was at the St. Jacobus Retreat Center. And it was a beautiful experience because there were 40 or 50 priests, maybe more, I'm not exactly sure how many, from the metropolis all gathered together for fellowship to deepen our faith. Uh, we had a keynote speaker and all this, all these great things. And part of our uh, program was that we ha had a liturgy at the camp uh, with all the priests present. So imagine now a church, only uh, the bishop served with two priests. I was one of the, I was, 
honored to be chosen as one of the two priests. And the rest of the priests were sitting, standing in the church, um, just as you would be on a, on a normal Sunday or an, on any church day. But at the time of the kiss of peace, instead of just the serving priests exchanging the kiss, all every priest that was in the church, we made a circle basically, and we all exchanged the kiss of peace with one another. And uh, I can say personally that even though, even with the priests, sometimes there are disagreements and dissent, uh, God help us, we're, we're broken too, that in that moment, I can tell you from my own experience, there was a deep sense of love and respect and peace among each and every one of us that was there in the, in the chapel of the retreat center that day. I want to share a quick, see how we're doing on time, oh, we're doing great, okay. I want to share uh, another powerful story from this wonderful book, Experiences of the Divine Liturgy, which I really love, uh, about the kiss of peace. So this is, comes from 1933, Siberia. So there, weren't, were these, uh, there was a group of Russian scientists that were doing research. I don't know what they did wrong to get sent to Siberia to do research, but they were there doing research. Uh, they were in a town where actually there were no uh, inhabitants, there were no people actually living there, it was only prisoners. Uh, so it was like a, imagine like a lab, uh, prison camp or something like that. M many of them, however, were priests, deacons, and monks, and even bishops that were part of the prisoners. Because remember, in, uh, during, when, uh, during the rise of communism and things like that, Christianity was outlawed in uh, Russia, and many, 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 God knows how many thousands and maybe even millions of Christians were martyred um, through communism. So... These camps were very brutal uh, for, the, for the prisoners. And many of the prisoners died from the cold and from hunger. But this person who wrote the story says that it was the month of July and the weather was actually good. So they were working. Uh, they were one night they were sitting by the fire, the researchers now, they were st doing the studies, were sitting by the fire and talking with each other. And as they were sitting, they could hear moans and groans coming from the nearby forest and the trees. And they were wondering what, what this was, what was going on, because it wasn't usual to hear uh, human voices when there was nobody around. So they were, one morning when they woke up, they were suddenly woken, they were suddenly awoken, excuse me, by a great groan coming from the forest. So they picked up their binoculars to kind of look and see what was going on. And they saw marching about 60 prisoners. Uh, and they were getting closer and closer to the researchers' camp. And they, were, they could tell that they were very hungry and they were treated very poorly. So the guards that were escorting these prisoners came over to the camp where the researchers were and told them, you have to go in your tents. And the researchers kind of knew what that meant, that these prisoners were going to be executed. So... They went into their camp, but the, tents, the tent that they had had a, some holes in them, and they were peeking through to see what was going on. So the, as the prisoners were being marched forward, they stopped at some point near a ditch, and they were lined up <laughs> along the edge of the ditch. But what did the researchers see that amazed them was that all these prisoners were priests. They could see them wearing their crosses. They could see them wearing their, some of their priestly garb. And they saw that the priests were ex embracing one another with a holy kiss. In other words, they were doing the kiss of peace from the divine liturgy. So imagine now 60 priests and bishops and deacons and who knows who else uh, getting ready to be martyred. And what are they doing? They're embracing one another and kissing one another and exchanging the kiss of peace. And they were saying things like, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, quoting Christ from the cross. And uh, so the first one... One by one, of course, they were asked if they would renounce their faith. And one by one, they denied uh, or they rejected the offer to deny Christ. And one by one, they were all executed uh, by the guards. I think that's a beautiful example for us to follow. That even in the face of death, that the peace of, of God and the, and the love of God, even for the guards who were going to kill them, was present in those clergymen, was present in those priests. And the expression for that was that they themselves exchanged the kiss of peace among each other before their martyrdoms. In most churches today, as we move forward, and in most churches today, the kiss of peace is only exchanged by the priests. 
Some churches, however, do do the kiss of peace in a modified form among the people. The hard part about doing the kiss of peace is it, become, it can become disruptive if it's not done in the right way. Imagine if Panagias was full uh, on the capacity, you know, with a thousand people upstairs, maybe more, who knows, standing room only. And at this point in the service, we have a thousand people turning left and right and embracing one another and kissing one another and speaking to one another. It would be a very large commotion. So while I'm in uh, favor personally, my own personal opinion, while I'm in favor of the church looking into the church in America, looking into kind of bringing this back, bringing the kiss of peace back, we have to kind of think of a way to do it where we can preserve the holiness and the sanctity of the sacrament and not lose kind of the decorum, not lose the peace of the service, because that would defeat the purpose anyway. So after the kiss of peace, the priest turns again to the altar and says, the doors, the doors, in wisdom, let us be attentive. And then the people all together say the creed. So again, turning to our history books, the, in the early times of Christian hi history, the church found itself under persecution for the first until Constantine. So 325, three, I think the Edict of Milan was 315, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, um, which legalized Christianity in the Roman Empire. So for the first three centuries of Christianity, there was a great persecution. And it was very common, while the Christians were gathered, for the, especially for the liturgy, for the Roman guard to be sent uh, to surround the church and to arrest and even uh, execute the Christians that were there because it was illegal. Uh, so the Christians living in that time risked their lives every time they went to church uh, in order to worship the Christ who they believed to be the true God. So at this point, what was the impact on the liturgy of these persecutions was that at this point of the service, the doors of the church were closed. For, first of all, for safety, for the people that were worshiping inside. There was even like a, a doorkeeper whose job in the church it was. Like nowadays we have ushers who kind of welcome people and can help guide people, especially guests, to the church. But in those times there was a doorman, basically, who would stand at the door and make sure that there were no intruders that were going to cause harm to the people worshiping inside. Thankfully, we don't have to worry about that anymore. In a way, the closing of the doors also is a representation, though, of the division between the church and the world at large. And what is this division? It's not a self-imposed division. It's not that we cut ourselves off from the, uh, from the outside world, but it's the division of unbelief. In your, on your quote sheet, there's a quote there that says, The closed doors form an external barrier and an image of the separation that unbelief makes between the world and Christ. So when there is unbelief, there is that division between the church and the outside world. We have to be a light, enlightening that division, but that we have to be cognizant that that reality of the division exists. So faith in Christ alone overcomes the barrier. So only through faith is that barrier broken down and people can enter the church. Another thing that we can think of as we hear the doors, the doors, St. Nicholas Cavasilas in his commentary says that while the physical doors of the church are closed, he says the spiritual doors of our hearts are called to be opened, open to God who will soon be pre present among us. He says, open the doors in this wisdom, proclaiming and listening to these high teachings constantly, not inattentively, but eagerly, devoting all your minds to it. So in other words, he's saying, open your hearts for God to come in. And uh, right after this, of course, uh, we make our proclamation of faith, which is the creed. The creed itself has a long history. Uh, it comes especially from the fourth century. There was a great heresy at the time called Arianism. So there was this um, priest from Alexandria, whose name was Arius, and he was uh, teaching that Christ, Jesus Christ, was not God. He was not true God. And this caused a great rift in the church. There was a great divide in the church. And so St. Constantine the Great, who was the emperor at the time, called the church together to meet. And he said, we have to get together and discuss this and see what the church thinks about Arius' teaching. And so through this first ecumenical council, they rejected Arius' teaching. They proclaimed the truth about Christ and that he is true God, true God of true God, light of light, true God of true God. And so that's why much of the creed is about Christ, because the church was very concerned about proclaiming that Christ was the true God and that everything that we find in the Gospels about him is true. The second portion of the creed comes from 381, the second council, which took place in Constantinople. 
And this had to do with more with the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so that's why we see then the, Holy, the, the section of the creed about the Holy Spirit and about the, the life of the church, uh, the resurrection of the dead, one baptism for the remission of sins, was added at, at, by 381. So the creed as we have it has been exi in existence since 381. And it's been part of our liturgy since the 6th century, so for about 1,500 years or so. Why is, import why is it important to still include the creed? I mean, we're not fighting Arius anymore. We're not fighting... We may not feel like we're fighting against heresy, but um, in truth, we do work. The church is still working against heresy to this very day. Heresy still exists. And the creed is a protection from falling into the traps of modern-day heresy. What are some modern-day heresies? I would say pluralism is a modern-day heresy. Believing that uh, multiple things can be true at the same time. For example, when people say, well, your, your, your religion is good for you, and your religion is good, my religion is good for me. It may be good for you, but that doesn't mean that they're both true. The church fights against that. We say, no, there is one true God. And that's we, we proclaim that especially in the creed. So things like that. We hear, I mean, on, if you look on social media, if you take five minutes on social media, you're bound to come across someone who... Uh, post some ridiculous article about the real Jesus or about uh, this and that. And so those things, we can consider them as heresies. And we have to fight for the truth that we know it to be uh, as we know it, passed down through the Gospels, through the Apostles, through St. Paul, and through 2,000 years of tradition as we have it today. So including the creed and proclaiming it loudly and proudly uh, is a testament to the importance of truth. So as we move forward in the liturgy, proclaiming the creed, offering the creed as a prayer. We can think of the creed even as a prayer. Offering that faith to God. We can then move forward in the liturgy to really the meat and potatoes, which is what we call the anaphora, the offering. So as we get closer and closer to Holy Communion, it's very important to offer that faith to God first and then go forward uh, to receive the holy gifts and to offer the holy gifts to God and to receive them back to us as well. We just have a few more minutes. If there are any questions, I can take them now before we depart. Question in the back? No? Anyone else? Yes. Yes, we were at a service and um, the royal doors were closed during the consecration mm -hmm. open. Yes. Does that also show the separation between the altar? What would I... Uh, what I read, actually this has more to do I, in my own research, I believe, with what we talked about last month, which was the symbolism of the great entrance. So we talked about St. Germanos. The question was, some churches will close their royal gates during the consecration of the, of the gifts. Why does that happen? So during the great entrance, St. Germanos, as we were, if we remember, talks about how the great entrance is like the burial procession of Christ. And so the gifts are placed on the altar, they're covered, and Christ is in the tomb. So from St. Germanos' interpretation, when the gates are closed, it is like the stone in front of the tomb, closing the tomb. Now when the gifts are consecrated and the, offered as the body and blood of Christ to the people, the gates are opened again. It's like the stone being rolled away. The resurrection is taking place. And so every divine liturgy, in a way, is an experience of the resurrection again, even this day, as if it was happening today. And it does happen today in a mystical way that's very difficult to understand. I can't wrap my head around it very easily. So that'll be another. Maybe next year we'll do that for the whole year. We could talk about that in time and eternity and things like that. So in my research, that's what I found, um, why they, some churches close the gates. There may be other reasons as well. So any other questions? Yes. Um, about the, the creed. Towards the end of the creed, we say in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And yes. I always understood that Catholic, that word, to mean kind of like the united or unified or one church. But yes. often you'll hear people, particularly those of Catholic faith, say, mm -hmm. well, we say it in the creed. Yeah. So that, in fact... Yeah, yeah the word Catholic in the creed, uh, uh, is, the question is about the word Catholic. When we say one holy Catholic and apostolic church and how sometimes our Catholic... Uh, cousins in the faith, I'll call them, uh, they like to th say that we proclaim their church in our creed. It's not true. The, Catholic, the word Catholic should be lowercase in the creed, not uppercase. We're not talking referring to the Catholic church in the creed. The word Catholic means universal. So when we say one holy Catholic and apostolic church, that means the church is meant to be for the whole world. 
And so we believe in that one church, and we believe that the church is for everyone and for everything, but not, does not necessarily, it does not refer at all to the Catholic church specifically. So if anyone brings that up to you, just tell them they're being silly. So <laughs> any other questions before we depart? Okay. Thank you, everyone, for coming again today. Next month, we'll meet again, and we'll talk about, as I said, the Anaphora, which is one of the great moments of our liturgical practice, if not the greatest moment. So thank you. God bless. <laughs>